Morning guys, it's great to see you all this morning. Welcome to our service again and our celebration. It seems a bit weird having a celebration at times like this where there's still so much that seems to be wrong in our world and not normal and not going right. But I just wanted to remind you all this morning that we always have a cause for celebration, no matter what's going on in our lives. I know it might not feel like it at times, it might feel really hard, but we always have a cause for celebration. Now I asked people in my form at school in one of our online lessons the other day just to share some good news with me and it just caught me that there wasn't much good news going around. Like there were five or six people who just said no idea, nothing, can't think of anything good at all. But there were two or three people who shared that great news and I just wanted to share with them as well in their celebration where they just said oh my grandparents have just gone and got their jab, they just had their first bit of vaccine and they were really excited by that and it was great to see people sharing excitement. And I know in my family WhatsApp groups, they've got three or four, four or five WhatsApp groups on the go at the moment. It's really weird for me having people messaging and messaging back people because I'm not the most social person at all times. But again, those groups have been filled over the past week or two with just people going, oh, I've got my appointment for my vaccine. And people just being really excited by having that to look forward to. And I just wanted to share again with you guys this morning. As I just said, we always have a reason to be thankful. We always have a reason to be celebrating as Christians and our reason is Jesus. The reason we bothered signing onto Facebook this morning or logging onto Zoom to watch together is because of him, because of his death and resurrection and the hope we have of eternal life with him. I just wanted to share that again just to remind you simply this morning that we have a reason to celebrate because of Jesus. Covid doesn't have victory in our lives. Jesus has victory in our lives. And that's why we're here this morning. That's why we're going to be hearing God's word this morning. That's why we're going to be singing together. That's why we pray together. That's why we can celebrate together. And in our celebrations, our time together, I'm just going to invite you to a couple more things that are going on in the next couple of weeks. We've got a quiz together. It's great to spend time together, even for fun and a bit of friendly competition with a quiz. And on the 16th of Feb, we'll be able to join together in a quiz. And again, it'll be in the evening. If you want to be invited to that, just let us know. It should come out on our usual church emails with the code to Zoom. But it'd be great to see loads of you joining us on that quiz. As well as that, the day after, on Ash Wednesday on the 17th, we'll be joining together again for another service together, another celebration together, another time to set our hearts and our minds focused on the time of Lent in preparation for celebrating Jesus' resurrection at Easter. It would be great to see loads of you on there. It's great to see you outside of just these Sunday meetings and these Sunday Zoom calls. As well as that, with our small groups, we're still meeting up in our small groups and it'd be great if you're interested, please let us know again and we'll put you in touch with Chris and he'll try and let you know what small groups are going on, when they are. We're not bounded by distance anymore. Wherever you are, you can join one of those small groups as we're meeting on Zoom or whether it's on Facebook chat or setting up WhatsApp groups to talk together. It'd be great for you to be involved in that as well so you're not feeling disconnected at this time. But as we start our service this morning, our celebration this morning, let's pray together and then let's sing together. So Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your victory, Lord. Despite what's going on in the world at the moment, Lord, we know we have good news to share. And that is you are victorious. And through you, we can have victory over death. We can have eternal life together. Thank you, Father, for everything you've given us, Lord. That you want to be part of our lives each and every day. And that you fill us with your spirit. Be with us this morning as we worship you, we pray. Fill our hearts with joy, fill our hearts with peace, fill our hearts with love. And Father, bring healing to this nation, Lord, because we know that you have victory. Blessed be your name, God. When the darkness closes in, Lord, we will still say blessed.
seem so filled with darkness, Lord. Blessed be your name. Your name is higher than any, Lord. You are wonderful. You are powerful. You are awesome. You are majesty. Thank you, Father, that you are victorious over all things, Lord, even death. Thank you, Father, that victory isn't just yours, Lord, but we can share in that victory together, Lord. Be with us, we pray. Amen. Come 
Hi everyone, I just want to take one minute of your time just to tell you a little bit about what we're going to be doing with the children and young people from our church this year. We're starting a new thing and they're called our Path Packs and they're going to be full, coming through your doorway, full of all this exciting stuff um, that's coming your way this month. And they're going to be based all around a different word of the month each month. This month we're thinking about love and we're especially thinking what does God think about love? And to do that, we've got so much going on. So we've got our newsletter, our word of the month card with lots of exciting activities on. We've got different crafts for you to get involved with and show us. We've got our memory verse cards, which have got the word, the verse for the month, this month. We've got how to set up different kinds of prayer stations at home. So some ideas there for you. We've got how to get involved in the Bible and how to get involved in Lent and some puzzle stuff too. It's really exciting stuff. And if that's not enough, we've set up a new group on Facebook. It's linked to our Facebook page already, our Farnworth Baptist Church page, and it's called Path Farnworth. So if you search for that and join it. Now that's for everyone because there's going to be stuff on there that is for any age. So whether you're two or 200, um, there's going to be stuff on there that's just going to be really great to get involved with while we're staying at home but we want to keep on learning about God together. So please do join that group, um, especially if you're one of our Power Pack or our Sharpa or our Live Parents. There's already stuff on there, um, which is really great to get involved with the Word of the Month. Um, and at the end of each month, we're also going to have a meetup. We're going to have a Zoom path group, and that's where um, all our Power Pack and Alive and Sharper kids come along to that. We're going to play some great family games all together. And um, you can even bring your grown-ups if, if you want to. And um, we're going to have lots of fun and a catch-up each month. So if you can come along to those, it'd be so great to see you. I know all the, all the kids' workers are really dying to see you as well. Um, and that's what we're up to. We're really excited about it and I hope you are too. We'll see you soon. Today's reading is from Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 21 to 31. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown. Scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth, and when he blows on them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, call them all by name. By the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, and not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God? the creator of the end of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength and they shall mount up with wings like eagles and they shall run and not be weary, they shall walk and not faint. Amen. We come now to a time of communion, where we share together in the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it doesn't really matter that even though we're apart, even though we're all in our own homes, really we can share together and so be together over this meal, because we approach the Lord's table even in our own homes. So before we share in our bread and our wine or whatever form they might take in your house, then let's just pray together and give this meal to God. 
loving God, we thank you that because of you, because of your amazing saving work, Lord, it doesn't matter that we don't stand together in the same building, but Lord, in our hearts and in our minds, we can be together because of the amazing work that you did on the cross that made us all a part of your body, that brought us together as children in God's family. And so, Lord, we ask that you bless each bread, each wine that we share. Lord, we ask that you be with each of us in our own homes. But Lord, help us to know that we are together in you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord God. Amen. Let's just share together in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So let's share together now, in our bread and in our wine, as we just celebrate the amazing gift that God has given us. That ability to be set free from all sin, all of those things that weigh us down. So we share together in the bread. And now let's drink together as we remember the blood of Jesus that he shed for us so that we may be washed whiter than snow. Let's drink together in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes, loving Father, we thank you again. We thank you that we have shared this communion with one another. Lord, wherever we are, help us to know always that we are with you and that we are with each other. And Lord, may we be comforted. May we know that joy of being part of your family. We thank you and we love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Fulfill
It happened again this week, didn't it? That thing that brings joy to some of us and stresses the rest of us out. You know, they say that you really know you're an adult when you look out the window to see snow and instead of running to get your wellies to build a snowman, you go check whether you remember to buy the de-icer for the car. It tells you, doesn't it, how old you've gotten sometimes about your reaction to things. And I love snow. I'm one of the people who it just really brings joy to and, and to my kids as well, they just love it. They see the snow and it's like, right, we've got to go outside and make those snowmen and throw some snowballs at mummy. Um, but I do kind of feel a little bit of a dilemma when I see the snow outside. I feel a little bit of a dilemma because I love it so much that I just love seeing it. When it's just fallen and it's just settled on the ground. It's just so beautiful outside. I love how pure and picturesque it looks. I love how white and beautiful everything is. It's like everything's been cleaned. And um, it would just be a shame in some ways to go outside and make a mess of it with my footprints. You know, it never quite looks the same, doesn't it, once, does it, when um, someone's walking, walk through it. And I wanted to share with you just this picture that um, Snow always reminds me of this time um, back in Cliff College days when uh, me and Patrick were there. We were so lucky to live there and we had this view and one day it just snowed um, for like a week or something and it was just covered. The whole valley was just covered in this beautiful white blanket of snow and just looked out the window to see that. I know some of you will be thinking, oh, no, that was awful. I'd hate to be in that much snow, but um, but it was. It was just so beautiful to be in and to look at. You kind of, for me anyway, you, you kind of can't help but be amazed by the majesty of it all. And it's the same kind of majesty as in that passage that Frankie read for us earlier. Isaiah 40 verses 21 to 31. We have this stunning account of the majesty of God, just passage after passage. If you've not got it open still, um, can I just ask you turn to it, get your Bibles out and turn to Isaiah 40 um, uh, verses 21 to 31 because you need to know that we're not lying to you. And verse after verse in this short section tells us of God's sovereignty over all things, over all creation. It says, you know, he's the one who sits above the earth. And it gives this picture of him stretching out the heavens like a tent to live in. He is the one who can raise up princes and rulers and just as easily blow them away again. He is the one who is mighty in power. He's beyond comparison, beyond understanding, infinite, wise, everlasting creator. It's all there. And if we skip back a bit just to verse 16 before the passage that Frankie read for us, we see it says, Lebanon would not provide enough fuel for the fire, nor are its animals enough for a burnt offering. And he's saying, you know, the whole country of Lebanon, a place that is famed for its amazing trees, that whole country couldn't provide enough fuel for a fire to burn a burnt offering for God. It's saying our God is so amazing that he is worthy of more worship than we could ever give to him. That wonder of God's majesty is laid out for us verse after verse. And it wasn't just written for us, but it was written with a purpose. The writer who writes here was speaking to the nation of Israel, a nation who'd been through a pretty horrendous time. When Isaiah first started writing his book, Israel were dealing with a threat from the nation of Assyria. Now they'd been under threat for a long time. They'd threatened war. They were under attack constantly. They were dealing with the uncertainty of their lands being taken away and their people being captured. Years and years of fear and uncertainty about this threat, but they fended them off. And then in chapter 39, 
we have Isaiah make another prophecy and it's not a good one. The Babylonians were coming and they would be an even greater threat than the one that the Israelites had faced so far. God's people were going into exile. Unfortunately, that prophecy came true. And in fact, it was over 200 years of exile for Israel. Powerless to the Babylonians who carried their people away, who took them away from their home and everything that they knew, their entire life was gone. Everything that they had known, the way that they had known things to be, everything was different now. And up till now, Isaiah's writings had been full of warnings about this happening, about what path the Israelites were going down, where it would lead them if they didn't turn back to God, if they didn't heed God's warnings. And it came true. And Isaiah, knowing that this was coming, Obviously, he didn't live um, for the whole 200 years that they were in exile, but he knew that it was coming. He knew that Israel was going to be in exile. And God instructed him to write words of comfort for his people, words that would carry them through the dark times, words that would bring them hope of a new Jerusalem, hope that it was all passing, that it was all going to be over. And God wanted Isaiah and he wants I, Isaiah and his disciples to pass that message of hope on to his people, to bring comfort to people in exile. What is it that we can turn to now when we need comfort and hope, when things feel out of control? I think we should take some lessons from Isaiah. Isaiah starts with this passage, this reminder of the majesty and splendour of God, of the power of God. And he says, the God that you can know is the God who is above all the rulers of this earth. Who are these rulers though? In those times it was princes and kings. And of course we have princes and kings too, just like Isaiah's time did. But they're not the only ones who hold power over God's people or over anyone's life. I don't think they're the only ones that we find listed in the Bible either, either then or now. What rulers can you think of that have influence over people's lives today? What things are out there that are dictating how people have to live? What things are out there that change people's lives? Right now we have an obvious one, don't we? We've got coronavirus. Sickness appears to be a ruler of this world, more so than it did maybe a year or two ago. It's changed our lives, it's dictated how we live in this world, it's in order just to, well quite rightly, to keep other people safe, we have to change the way that we act and behave. For some time, right now, it holds some power in the world. And there are other things too though. Just like in Isaiah's time, there are the rulers like government and um, in some countries, royalty, who control people's lives, for better or for worse. There's money as well. The Bible mentions quite a lot as a ruler in this world. It changes how people act and how they behave. But I think they're not the only kind of powers. They're the big ones, aren't they? But they're not the only ones. I think there are some little ones as well that change how we act, that change how we want to look at ourselves. Things like addictions or the need for approval, things like that. And sometimes when we get into difficult places, when we try to look ahead, it's these things that are on the horizon. These things are the things that we can, all that we can see. It's hard to see past them. The rulers in this world like to cloud up our vision. So we can learn from what God has said in his word about these difficult times. It is important that we do. And I think Isaiah's message of hope to the Israelites in exile is important because it begins with this reminder that God has majesty and power over all things. You know, it's a reminder, isn't it, that 
to the Israelites in exile and to those of us who go through times of darkness or loneliness, that when things are so bad and you've been in exile for so long, so long that no one can even remember the good times, when it seems like hope is a bit futile and when our vision gets clouded, by the many things in the world that want to change how we see ourselves. If you can't see past the struggles that are ahead, don't look ahead anymore. Look up. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Here, God is talking about the stars. So he says, you know, lift up your eyes and see who created these. He means the stars, who brings out their host. Um, God is talking about how he moves the stars by his voice. And do you know what the Babylonians worship? This pagan nation. Amongst other things, they worship the stars. Just think about that. These rulers, these Babylonian rulers who had come in and taken all the Israelites, who had captured them and held them captive. They were putting their hope and praying to these hosts, these stars. And yet the God of Israel, the people that they held captive, their God declares that the stars only come out because he calls them out. He calls them by name, each one of them. Because he is strong, not one of those stars goes missing. It's not by their power, but by his. Their gods obey the sound of our God's voice. They put their trust in these stars, but the God of Israel does not, but if the God of Israel does not call them, they can't even come out. And if that God is for us, then who can stand against us? The God of the stars is for us. It's incredible to think now, though, that the God who made all things, who, who put everything in its place and, and calls each star by its name, all 10 billion trillions of them, is also the one that calls us by name and wants us to put our trust in him too. These things, the, the so-called rulers of the earth, whether it's the occupying forces, or whether it's the governments, whether it's sickness or hunger or sin, they're powerless when it comes down to it because our God has created it all and he knows us by name. But they are quite good at cluttering up the horizon. They're quite good at spoiling the vision for us. So if you can't see ahead just yet, there's too many things in the way. Look up instead. Our God is Lord over all. And there are so many things that can become these little rulers for us in this world. But we need to remember they are just temporary things. They're creations, not creators. They hold enough power to get in the way, though, of people seeing that they have a future with God, but they don't have unlimited power, which our God does. Perhaps like the exiled Israelites in Isaiah's time, they don't remember how powerful God is. So many people don't remember how powerful God is and what he has done for us. Or maybe they just never knew in the first place, which these days is probably more likely. Or like further on in the passage, they might think that even if God is so powerful, then that's even more reason why he wouldn't be interested in our little lives anyway. I mean, God's got the stars to worry about. Why would he bother with us? I think sometimes even being a Christian makes it harder in a way because we feel it more. We feel it especially when we know that God is our saviour when we know that we've accepted him into our life and we know that he is the creator of all things and that he has power over all things. 
because we sing it every Sunday and we have it in our heads but but when things get tough it can be really hard to have faith in these things as well as knowing them. I think it's possible to know things and not have faith in them. I know I've been, had dark times myself when faith has been difficult because as much as I know these things up here, as much as I know that God loves me, as much as I know that he is with me, there's too much feeling down here and the feeling just is too big and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and it's like there's no room for that knowledge to reach down here anymore. There's no room because of the feeling. Like, like that knowledge just won't fit alongside the feelings that we have. We can know these amazing things about God, about his majesty, about his power, but trusting in them for ourselves, that's different. But you see, around 700 years later, Jesus, who was, by the way, himself God, he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. This is where it gets good. Because God's power has never been found just in acts of strength. And it's never been found in acts of domination. Like so many things of this world seek to have power. But God's power was ultimately demonstrated when he gave it all up to be a servant, when he gave it all up to be an otherwise normal human man who was taken prisoner, who was unjustly tried and executed on a cross of wood on the outskirts of town. That's where we see God's power truly revealed in the work of Jesus, the ultimate act of weakness in service to others, God shows his power. Because three days later, Jesus rose again and he defeated death once and for all. God is absolutely 100% invested in the little guy, in each man and woman, in the weakness, in the fallen of human life. That is where God's power is truly seen. Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. That's what it says. If God was only concerned with power, with making his will known and, and turning it around and making the world his own, if he was only concerned with that kind of power that the world is concerned with, then he could have come as a king. He could have come down and set up systems and institutions and, and palaces and, and made everyone obey him. But he didn't. He came as a very ordinary man who served others and died for us. And in doing so, he showed up every single power, every single ruler for the dust that they are. He showed them up for how powerless they are because they could not resist this one weak man and his act of ultimate sacrifice. They were weak and he was strong. Even the smallest and weakest among us, God sets his power and his strength upon them and he helps us through all the dark days. So the other day, when it snowed, I got on my wellies and if I'm honest, I even got the waterproof trousers out and the hat, glove, scarf and everything else just to stay warm um, because I love the snow, but I hate cold. And I was thinking as I was walking through the snow to get my, my daughter to nursery, I was thinking, you know, there's just so many reasons not to tell people about God. There's just so many reasons not to do it. Not to share that hope that we've got. As I speak kind of really as someone who spends far too much time agonising over the things that I say and saying what I'm sure is the wrong things in conversations. I never 
I'm totally sure that I managed to say the right things. And it's really easy to be too afraid to share the good news about a God who is all powerful and holy, who loves us because do you know what? I'm just bound to say something stupid that will lead people further away. Um, if you like, I'm too afraid to spoil the view with my footprints. And other times, you know, things look a bit icy and a bit dangerous and I don't want to go in there and slip and hurt myself. You know, maybe someone will reject me because of the message of Jesus. Maybe they'll reject Jesus because of me. Rejection always stings a bit, doesn't it? But the message that God has, that message that even in our weakness, he can make us strong, that even in his weakness, he's still far more powerful than anything in this world, coronavirus or not, you know, all these things. That message of comfort for God's people needs to be shared. It needs to get out there. It needs to set free the captives who are living under the rule of other things, whether that's sin, whether that's fear, whether it's poverty, whatever. It's a message that needs to get out there. And God goes out there and he calls us to join him. He's sending us out there to meet with him. And I think, you know, at some point you just have to be brave enough to make some footprints, make some tracks in the snow. You have to be prepared to make a mark because the God that controls the skies, the God that controls the stars and the sun and the rain and the snow, he has a message for his people on this earth. And it's a message that needs to be known. The message is this. You are known. You are cared for. And you are loved. I think right now that's a message people need to hear. It's a message we need to take outside with us. We can't wait for people to come inside and hear it. Especially right now. We're not allowed inside. That's not how it works. God is sending us out. And at some point, we've just got to go. Possible. 